Welcome to Montreal Rocks. And today we are in talks with Nick Albrook of the band Pond. If you don't know the band Pond, I guess you could say that Pond and Tame and Pala are twins. But if you had a choice to take one to a party, you're going to pick Pond. Is that pretty correct? I wouldn't say, but that's very kind of you. <laughs> you're, you're the more fun of the two, let's put it that way. That's very nice of you. I like to start off with uh, a little bit of an origin story to find out, you know, where Nick came from, how he got introduced to music. Uh, you probably have an early memory of flipping through your parents' record collection or their CDs or however they were listening to music. Is there a band or a song that really triggered something in you where music went from something you heard to something you felt? That's a great way of putting it. Um, there's heaps. There's heaps of times I can remember. Um, I remember when I was living in really young, like might have been about seven years old or something, living in Derby in the northwest of Australia, a really a remote region um i got um i got really into this australian grunge band called silverchair oh yeah um, yeah and they put out their their seminal work freak show and um i when my parents went out for a while i just blasted it so loud and I know honestly like seven years old and I blasted it so loud and and like for lack of a better word rocked out <laughs> until I was like drenched in sweat and lying on the floor panting and my sister came in I couldn't hear her knocking she like opened the door like, what's going on so I feel like that was that was pretty big. I also have a really cheesy moment that I don't I, I'm pretty sure this is how it went down, but um maybe it's been like Hollywoodified in my mind. But I remember my dad bought me um when he started realizing how into music I was. He bought me um uh a CD of The Who, um, uh, at the video store, and we got in and we got in the car and put it on, and cranked it up, and I think the first song was like, um, um, uh, what is it? I can go anywhere where I choose to, na, 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 when I lose, and it's got that big chord at the beginning. Yeah. Blew my mind. I think that was it. Anyway, it, it often takes those experiences as a child to unlock, like like a new path in terms of music, and then we kind of eventually create our own uh, personality when it comes to what we like, what we don't like. But sometimes you need that doorway to open up to go explore. And I think yeah. it, the exploration as a child, I think, is so important because it 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 probably says a lot about the type of music that you're playing now, having that as a background and having those discoveries uh, so young. Yeah. Yeah, probably. And then along your evolution, you eventually uh, were in a band called the uh, Mink Muscle Creek. What did you learn from that experience? <laughs> um, pretty much learned how to play. Um, how to play in a band and how to actually play properly. Um, we were terrible. We were terrible when we started. Um, and just enjoyed it so much. Uh, and did it so often, like living together and doing it every day, playing every single day for fun there's a, a real power to doing something bad because nobody starts off doing anything walking brushing your teeth you don't start off doing great you start off doing bad and you gradually improve 
I, a lot of, I think a lot of people stop the exploration of becoming a musician because they want to be great at it right from the start. But I think it needs somebody like you that will go there and just enjoy the process of being bad for a little while until you get good. Absolutely. Never a truer word spoken. It's um it's a it's a fun, it's a it's quite a tender balance as well, um, because <clears throat> you don't wanna it's very hard as a young person or an old or an old person when you're learning something new and the first thing you do sounds awful or feels awful, like you go for a run and you can barely move, you know. Um so there needs to be some way of feeling I know the first time I got taught how to play actual just full basic chords was that when I got hooked on guitar because it just it's like oh that's a song you know I know that song you can play Hey Jude all of a sudden or like you know the hundreds of simple simple songs um, but when I first got a guitar for Christmas like a really sturdy, big steel string acoustic guitar and a book of Jimi Hendrix tabs. I'd sit there trying to nut out his solos with a steel string acoustic guitar and just be like throwing my hands in the air, wondering why I was so God awful at playing this <laughs> instrument. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do it for years after that. I was so, so disheartened. <laughs> But you but, do have to get through it. You got to get through the experience of being being bad, and that's what. Because I don't know, like David Lynch talks about it. That that is the definition. That is that literally is what creativity is as a process: is doing something and then correcting something, correcting something that your deep inner voice says is bad and you don't like, and you want to change it. You have to be a hard yaka. Am I right? Yeah, I guess so. Hard <laughs> yakka, that's it. Well, we don't use that expression here in Canada, but uh, it just means uh, somebody that really gives it a, gives us his all. It's more the, um, I think, hard yakka is more the process, not a proper noun. Mm -hmm. It's like, um, today, how was work today? Oh, it was hard yakka. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> now I know the context of where to use it in my day to day. That's right. Yeah, you can throw it around all you like. I mean, one thing about being in a, a, Perth is an interesting uh, place, and Australia in general is is fascinating. I've always wanted to visit, but it must be quite a challenge to tour because everybody's like uh, separated by these long distances, and and you just see like a little bit of greenery, then like oh, like desert, then a little bit of there's a an oasis of a city, then the desert than an oasis of a city what was it like to uh tour you probably have a vivid memory of getting to a gig that in between those oasis yeah well you gotta fly now in australia if you if you're gonna tour which is sad um but it's just yeah it's just unfeasible like economically to take a whole bunch of people and um spend enormous amounts of money on fuel to drive across the you know the nullarbor um because brisbane sydney canberra melbourne tasmania and adelaide are all on the east coast and um well almost adelaide it's pretty close over there um and perth is on the west coast yeah so for a Perth band, it's like if you're gonna do anything, you gotta you gotta fly, um, or fly somewhere, which is a pain. But um, yeah, yeah, I I do remember vividly going playing a first show outside of Perth in Melbourne. The the name Pawn you said is inspired by Krep rock bands that have these one word names back in the day. Yeah. But when I when I think of a pond, I think of a man made like a small body of water versus like a lake. Are you happy being in a pond? Does that help you where you can really enjoy the music because you're not trying to please 
a lake full of people, but you're really just doing things for yourself. Is that kind of how I you see it? I think I at the beginning I saw it in a very sort of psilocybin way um as uh as being ponds being lakes in an ocean and us being a very small collective of um of 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 people flowing and interacting with the rest of the the human circus you know um so it was more like we're all we're all in a intermingling body um but we can loosely define ourselves as a, as a, as a pond even though it's sort of um i, I think i also think the pretty osmosizes with the rest of with the rest of yeah society. i mean it's, it's it's all the same base right water but i think sometimes we have to limit ourselves and not try to please everyone because when you please everyone you please no one so i think by okay. giving ourselves that limit those limits we can make music that's true to ourselves and who we are as a band not that i'm in a band but you're in a band uh i think that that kind of defines who pond is because you have an identity you have a, a style it will change over time but you seem to be taking more and more control over where you're going with this yeah that's nice to say um, specifically the you know this is the first album that you did uh without uh, kevin parker as a producer so yeah yeah it yeah, kind of yeah. shows that you're really taking control of your sound and you make it more you yeah yeah i suppose so um it's hard to say because we're all so informed by each other um so it can be it can be difficult to sort of delineate where um you know where one ends and the other begins <laughs> well maybe I'll, I'll i'll say it this way here's a quote for from emil uh, zatopek so uh everyone said emil you're a fool but when i won the european championship they said emil you're a genius so maybe this is that moment for you where you went from well i wouldn't say you're a fool but you went to becoming your own genius by doing things yourself that's great I love that you quoted uh, you quoted Zatopek. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm happy being a fool as well. I think the fool, the fool, um, there's infinite possibility for the fool. You know, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's that's that. It does feel really good to have, um, you know the last album just being a pond in house production um but it still sort of felt in house with kev doing stuff uh mm. but yeah no it's really it's really nice it felt it was it was um truly independent here's another quote this one is from uh agnes martin so <laughs> Art is the concrete representation of our most subtle feelings. So let's talk about maybe how a pair of slippers in, you know, inspired this deep philosophical dive that eventually gave us a song, uh, Gold Cup, Plastic Soul. Yeah. Well, um, I sort of started doing, I got in a really good routine in, uh, for a while which was just writing every day um, before, before I did any of the other stuff and before anyone else woke up. Um, and just sort of um, loosely directing, directing it towards something, something that I felt personally affected by. Um, so I started writing about my slippers that, I've been wearing for ages, um, the same brand, the same size from the same 
Vietnamese deli in Perth for like 12 years, I reckon. And then one day they just ran out and, uh, <laughs> and that was it. And it felt, it felt quite like profound and moving that this was something that had been, you know, it was the same pair of shoes, but very different pairs of shoes, just like I'm the same body, but I've been, my, all my cells have been replaced over and over again. And I've been shod in these cheap, you know, these, these cheap pairs of like these ter terrible slippers that are probably made in an awful factory somewhere. Um, and I guess I just spent a while spitballing and reflecting on like all of the different, all of the different sort of contrasting elements of what makes these slippers so stupid and crap. But also so like deeply, you know, feel feel such deep profundity surrounding them, and um, and how they sort of they they thinly separate me from from a true earthly experience over the last decades by about half a centimeter. <laughs> and I think I think that's true in general. A lot of people they have a protective bubble around them, and they fail to experience things to the fullest just maybe because they don't want to be embarrassed or they there maybe there's some fear anxiety and i think when you can take off the slippers and really experience foot on the ground feel the earth it's a whole different experience and it's only like you said a thin a, a thin layer that's separating you absolutely and um i think at the, i think at the time when i was writing that i was also emotionally you know, to, to, to stretch the analogy further, I think I was emotionally starting to take off the slippers. And, um, I think for a long time I'd been, I, I, I kept a, kept a sort of thin, um, sort of plastic shield between me and other people and not, and, and kept a lot to myself. Um, and then around the time I was writing that, I was actually starting to um, push the boat out, you know, open up a little bit and start to, um, yeah, start to reveal some things to people who love me and I love. Now, way this brings me to another quote, Ellsworth Kelly. Yeah. The negative is just as important as the positive. Do you find that exposing light on the negatives are in our lives uh, takes away its power. And if so, uh, what do you want to shine a light on now? Does it take away its power? You I know, if we, keep the, if we keep the darkness inside, it'll always be there. But as soon as you share it with a loved one, for example, it, it seems to take away its power. And that's how we, we get out of these phases. It is, yeah. Yeah, in my experience, I can't speak for everyone, but in my experience, that that is how. That's that's a savior. That's how you. That's how you can be saved from, from um. Yeah, from the deepest. Uh, pains and stuff like that is is to expose it, and I like as. As trite as it sounds, I've. Literally, I've felt that with song and with singing about something um, impossibly hard and you can almost feel it coming out and the weight just getting a, a little bit less and it's the same thing with um with with sharing it with a loved one um and someone who can really see you and hold it and um, reflect what you're feeling and stuff like that. The, um, the, the weight of the burden is shared. Yeah, 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 for sure. What do I want to shine a light on? I don't know. I'm always finding... It's always hard. I think after 
after like Tasmania, I was, um, I think I was kind of worn out from like talking about climate catastrophe. What because it's off? so real. It's like actually, it's just happening right now. So it sort of didn't feel, it almost didn't feel right or artistic. Um, it didn't feel artistic to talk about it. It was just like, yeah, that's, that's what's happening. Yes, it is. <laughs> you know, there was no sort of um, poetry to it. Well, let's talk about that. Uh, Yukio Mishima, uh -huh. I'm saying it right. Another yeah. quote, true beauty is something that attacks, overpowers, robs, and finally destroys. So how can we use music, maybe even your own, to accomplish this? To you know, you basically take a problem, you attack it, you you overpower it, you destroy it, and it becomes something beauty, beautiful. Yeah. Well, Yukio Mishima was a very, very disturbed man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he was a brilliant, brilliant person, but um, yeah. Deep, I think I think like one of those gene like a genius was truly truly disturbed really dark um, but absolutely amazing um, and obsessed with beauty and power and perfection which is just uh, almost to the detriment like he almost hated himself for not being perfect enough <laughs> Um, um, but yeah, I, I totally like, like using, using music as a, as a battering ram, you know, like a political social battering ram is something I really, really love and respect. And I almost want to do that. You know, like I just love my favorite bands, you know, like The Clash and uh, Midnight Oil. Um, and yeah, yeah, I think I think music can do can can do a lot. It can um, it can really ignite something. Look at everyone singing Kendrick Lamar at the, at the protests and stuff like that. It's powerful. Exactly. So you're talking about writing. Um, you have a miscellaneous phrase book. What does it take to be included in your miscellaneous phrase book uh, in the early morning writing sesh? No. I don't know. Hey, um, nothing. Nothing at all. Um, I wrote something, you know, it's, it's subjective. So, yeah. I wrote something about... Um, um uh in in Japantown in San Francisco I was buying a beer and the guy was like I need to see your ID and I showed him my ID and he said um are oh, you from Australia I'm from Indonesia and you know like the same hood yeah and that just touched me like I thought, oh my God, that's the energy we need going forward. You know, this guy's got it. Yeah, we are from the same hood. I grew up in Northwest Australia. It's like 200 kilometers from Indonesia. And anyway, so I wrote heaps about that. <laughs> and that's where, uh, yeah, people coming together and seeing the commonalities rather than separating because of looking for differences. Because we can always find differences. But when we look for commonalities, that that truly brings people together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, a few little fun stuff just to wrap this up. Uh, I appreciate your time. I'm going to show you your first Instagram post. Of course. And I want to see what memories this brings up. Oh, wow. It says sound checking Frio last night, which, uh, of course, uh, Frio is short for, I don't remember the name of the town. It's a... Uh, Fremantle. Fremantle. Yeah, I wrote that somewhere. There you go. Uh, this was in uh, 2013. 
Okay. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah, okay. Um. Who's that? Oh yeah. So we're we're mucking around. There's Hando. Hando's our uh, our um long long time roadie and guitar tech and friend. He's playing drums there. So this must have December twelfth. Oh, is that Kev playing bass? I think it's Kev. I'm so confused what's going on here. <laughs> so, like, we used to change around the lineup a lot. A lot. So when was it, did you say? 2013? 2013, yeah. So we must have just done... End of December, so end of the year. Okay, so we'd done, like... That was around the period we did... um south by southwest and um it actually worked for us like the way that people fantasize that it's gonna work for them it actually worked for us it was bizarre like you go you know the whole thing is like you'll go there and people will uh you know, people, will, people will notice you the india's industries everywhere and maybe even some celebrity will like bloody post about you or something and basically everything happened for us and um it was so, cool. <laughs> so uh speaking of uh well this is obviously you're prepping for a show you're going to be here in montreal on december 3rd uh 2022 at le studio td uh which is a nice little venue a great place to see a show uh it's going to be awesome uh just to end up i like there's a little game i like to play um it's called the fantasy rock band now i'm not a sports guy at all uh, no. although I'll, i i you know we have hockey canadians we love hockey i will watch the playoffs but i'm really not a sports guy i love music if you were to create the ultimate rock band we're talking singer guitarist bassist drummer any other musical instrument you want to add there uh from people that are dead or alive and they can't be from your own bands uh, who would they who would they? Who would you choose to be this fantasy rock band? <laughs> um. Okay, I'm just gonna go full teenage, and just yeah. Yes. Honestly, the most affecting singer for me, I think, is like. Is David Bowie? Um, it just hits so so powerfully in the heart. My and wife just gasped in the background, so you made a good choice. <laughs> there are probably better. There are maybe better singers. You know, it'd be like Aretha Franklin or um, I don't know, heaps heaps of you know. Um, Otis Red, actually Otis Redding. Uh, I was going to say, I think you're into Otis. I, I I read somewhere. Ooh. But I like David Bowie. Let's go with David. Okay, Bowie. I'll stick with Bowie. I'll stick with Bowie. Your um, first your first instinct is always good. Okay, cool. Um, guitar. Let's go. Um. Uh. Manuel Gottsting from Ashra. I'm re I'm I'm oh I didn't, I didn't pick the left handed guitarist. Ah oh well Manuel's in there now. Um him and Bowie can sort of get their Germanic <laughs> thing on. Um oh. Okay, um uh Jesus. Um, I, I think Prince should be on something. Um, uh, let's put him on, let's put him on bass. Sure. Um, he can play whatever. Um, do some BVs, take over from Bowie, you know, um, uh, I guess like John Bonham 
on drums because he's the best. Um, keyboardist. Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Someone good. Prince as well. <laughs> yeah, let's give him a keyboard and a bass and he'll can go w waddle between the two. Yeah, um, I don't know. Oh, let's have um who's good? Who's good at who's good at piano? Nina Simone. Let's go Nina Simone. Well, it's interesting because it, it tells me a little bit about your um your influences without asking that question. And to see that there's a mixture of uh modern well, I mean David Bowie it was modern even if it's old, but also at Bonham is like that classic rock. So you have that foundation of rock, uh, but with um a a more artistic layer to it with the bowies and and even the jazz parts with the simone and or otis redding for that matter so it, it kind of uh shows me a lot about who pond is and the music that you create has that energy of of jazz almost the experimentation of jazz but it has a lot of different elements i think what what makes it uh, an interesting listen is uh, all those elements together create something of uh, unity, like we talked about at the at the outset. Oh, thank you, very kind. Well, again, uh, just for those that uh, want to see uh, Nick perform live with his crew, uh, Le Studio TD, December third, twenty twenty two. Be there, don't miss it. It's, uh, it's going to be a great show. And again, uh, we want to thank you for your time, Nick. I, I I really appreciate the time you spent with us and uh, have a great show. Pleasure. Thanks for that. It was a good interview.